spoke about the Battle of Essling or Ilo and observed that it admitted a great deal to be said on both sides. He had remained on the field of battle but had retired in the night, and it might be thought that he had sustained a reverse. Lieutenant Bautzen, he observed, he had most decidedly gained. When only 17, said Napoleon, I composed a little history of Corsica, which I submitted to the Abbe Raynal, who praised and wished that I would publish it, adding that it would do me much credit and render great service to the cause in an agitation. I am, continued Napoleon, very glad I did not, as it was written, in the spirit of the day at a time when the rage for republicanism existed and contained the strongest doctrines that could be promulgated in support of it. It was full of republicanism and breathed freedom in every line, too much so indeed. I have since lost it. When at Lyon in 1786, I gained a gold medal from the college on the following theme. What are the sentiments most advisable to be recommended in order to render men happy? When I was seated on the throne a number of years afterwards, I mentioned this to Talleyrand who sent off a courier to Lyon to procure the treatise, which he easily obtained by knowing the theme as the author's name was unknown. One day afterwards, when we were alone, Talleyrand took it out of his pocket, thinking to please and play his court to me, put it into my hands and asked if I knew it. I immediately recognized the writing and threw it into the fire where it was consumed. In spite of Talleyrand's endeavors to save it, he was greatly mortified as he had not taken the precaution of causing a copy to be made previous to showing it to me. I was very much... Um, as the style of the work was similar to that in Corsica, abounding in Republican ideas and exalted sentiments of liberty suggested by the worth of a fervent imagination at a moment when youth and the rage of the times had inflamed my mind. The sentiments in it were too exalted ever to be put into practice. I asked his opinion about Robespierre. Robespierre, said Napoleon, was by no means the worst character who figured in the revolution. He opposed trying the queen. He was not an atheist. On the contrary, he had publicly maintained the existence of a supreme being in opposition to many of his colleagues. Neither was he of opinion that it was necessary to exterminate all priests and nobles, like many others. Murat, for example, maintained that to ensure the liberties of France, it was necessary that 600,000 heads should fall. Robespierre wanted to proclaim the ordre de la loi and not to go through the ridiculous effort of trying them. Robespierre was fanatic, but he was incorruptible and incapable of robbing or of causing the deaths of others, either from personal enmity or a desire of enriching himself. He was an enthusiast, but one who really believed that he was acting right and died not worth a sou. In some respects, Robespierre may be said to have been an honest man. All the crimes committed by Hébert, Chomet, Collot d'Herbois, and others were imputed to him. Murat, Murat continued he, Billot de Varenne, Fouché, Hébert, and several others were infinitely worse than Robespierre. It was truly astonishing, added Napoleon, to see those fanatics who bathed up to the elbows in blood would not for the world have taken a piece of money or a watch belonging to the victims they were butchering. There was not an instance in which they had not brought the property of their victims to the comité of public safety wading in blood at every step they believed they were doing right and scrupled to commit the smallest act bordering on dishonesty such was the power of fanaticism that they conceived they were acting uprightly at a time when a man's life was no more regarded by them than that of a fly at the very time that Murat had and Robespierre were committing those massacres if Pitt had offered them 200 millions, they would have refused it with indignation. They even tried to guillotine some of their own numbers, such as Fabre, Deglantine, who were guilty of plundering. Not so tally, Brandanton, Barra, Fouché. They were figurants, and they would have espoused any sign for money. Talleyrand, c'est le plus vieux, 
des agiteurs comme Corrompu, sans opinion, mais en district. He is the most vile of agitators, totally corrupt, without any opinion of his own, but he's got spirit. A figure ready to sell himself and everything to the best bidder. Barat was such another. When I commanded the army of Italy, Barat made the Venetian ambassador pay him $200,000, I think he said, for writing a letter begging of me to be favorable to the Republic of Venice, which I, here he made use of a most significant gesture. I never paid any attention to such letters. For my first career, I was commanded myself. Talleyrand and Lake Manor sold everything. Fouché, in a less degree, his traffic was in an inferior line. I ask how it had been possible that Barrere had escaped during the different abulations of the revolution. Barrere? Parce c'est un homme sans caractère, because he has no character. A man who changed and adapted himself to every side. He has a reputation of being a man of talent, but I did not find him so. I employed him to write, but he did not display ability. He used many flowers of rhetoric, but no solid argument. Nothing but coglionery wrapped up in high-sounding language. Of all the sanguinary monsters out of the emperor who reigned in the revolution, B.O. de Varenne was the worst. Carnot, c'est le plus honnête des hommes. He's the most honest of men. He left France without a sou. Madame Campan, continued Napoleon, had a very indifferent opinion of Marie Antoinette. She told me that a person well known for his attachment to the queen came to see her at Versailles on the 5th to 6th of October, where he remained all night. The palace was stormed by the populace. Marie Antoinette fled undressed from her own chamber of that of the king for shelter, and the lover descended from the window. On going to seek the queen in her own bedroom, Madame Campan found that she was absent, but discovered a pair of breeches, which the favorite had left behind in his haste, which were immediately recognized. After the offense of Brumaire, said he, I had a long conversation with C.S., during which I entered considerably into the state of France and diverse political matters. C.S. went immediately after to sup with some stern Republicans, his most intimate friends. After the servants had left the room, he took off his cap and throwing it upon the ground. Monsieur said he, Il n'y a plus de république, elle est déjà morte. There's no more republic, it's already dead. I have conversed today with the man who is not only a great general, but of himself capable of everything, and who knows everything. He wants no counselors, no assistants. Politics, laws, the art of governing are as familiar to him as the manner of commanding an army. He is young and determined. The Republic is finished. But, cried the Republicans, if he becomes a tyrant, il faut le poignard de Brutus. He's going to need the sword of Brutus. Et là, mes amis, alors nous tomberons dans la main de Bourbon et que est pur. Well, we're falling under the head of the Bourbons. What's worse? Fouché added, he never was my confidant. Never did he approach me without bending to the ground. For him, I never had esteem. As a man who had been a terrorist and a chief of Jacobins, I employed him as an instrument to discover and get rid of the Jacobins. Septembrisers and other of his old friends, by means of him, I was enabled to send into banishment to the Isle of France 200 of his old associate Septembrisers, who disturbed the tranquility of France. He betrayed and sacrificed his old comrades and participators in crime. He never was in a situation to demand my confidence or even to speak to me without being questioned, nor had he the talents requisite for it. Not so Talleyrand. Talleyrand really possessed my confidence for a long time and was frequently acquainted with my projects for a year or two before I put them into execution. Talleyrand is a man of great talents, although wicked, unprincipled, and so covetous of money as not to care by what means he obtains it. His rapacity was so great that I was obliged, after having in vain warned him several times, to dismiss him from my employments. Siez also possessed my confidence and was a man of great talent, but unlike Talleyrand, Siez was an upright man. 
He loves money, but he will not try to obtain it otherwise and by legitimate means, unlike the other who would grasp at it in any form. The 26th, the following observations upon our embassy to China were delivered to Napoleon. It appears that your ambassador, Lord McCartney, was obliged in 1793 to submit it to the Kowtow. Without doing which he would not have been received, your ministers, who must have foreseen this, in fact, who did foresee difficulty in etiquette, had in sending out Lord Amherst authorized him to comply with it. And it appears that his private opinion was that he ought to perform it and that in refusing to do so, he suffered himself to be guided by bad advisors. It is an error, but still one which is very generally believed that an ambassador represents a sovereign. An ambassador, however, does not represent his sovereign, as in fact none of the stipulations of affairs which he signs are valid until after ratification. And as to his rank and etiquette, there never has been an example of sovereigns having treated them as equals, never having returned their visits, never having given way for them, nor treated them as they would have treated a foreign sovereign. The false idea that ambassadors represented the sovereign is a tradition of feudal customs, according to which at the rendering of homage, when a great vassal was prevented from tendering it in person, he caused himself to be represented by an ambassador. In this case, the ambassador really received the honors due to his master. The character of an ambassador is of the same nature as that of a minister plenipotentiary or an envoy with this difference that an ambassador is in the first degree of minister, the second as an envoy, and the third and in negotiations. These three have the same rights. Whatever they stipulate or sign must be admitted for the ratification of their prince, but in etiquette, there is a great difference. The ambassador in precedency ought to be treated like the first lord in the country, like princes or dukes and ministers of state, the minister plenipotentiary, like nobles of the second rank in precedency, at court and on a voice, like those of the third. As to charge d'affaires, they are not accredited with the sovereign, but with the minister. The English and Russian ambassadors had a right to the same distinctions and ought to have followed the same etiquette as was practiced by the princes and the chief mandarins. Now these last performed kowtow, and therefore the ambassadors ought to have done the same, and the emperor of China had a right to require it. It has been said that a French captain named Rock who had been in China during the reign of Louis XIV, had refused to perform the kowtow, but it must be considered that this officer was not an ambassador, nor a minister plenipotentiary, nor an envoy, and he was at liberty to act as he pleased equally as the Chinese government was his liberty to consider him being of more or less importance. But a man charged with a diplomatic mission ought to have performed the kowtow and could not refuse it without being in wanting of respect to the emperor in the same manner as this could not be refused without showing disrespect to his character of ambassador. Lord McCartney, it appears, Lord Amherst thought of diverse expedients, which had been also tried by the Russian minister. They proposed that a Mandarin of equal rank to the ambassador should perform the kowtow before the picture of the King of England or that by a public declaration. The Chinese monarch should promise that if you sent an ambassador to England, he should perform the kowtow. The Chinese rejected these proposals. Have a good reason. If a Chinese ambassador were received in London, he would have no right to perform the kowtow, but he ought to follow the same etiquette in the presence of the king of England as that observed by the princes and ministers of state and the knights of the garter when they are admitted before the throne, which would be the English kowtow. These proposals were therefore unreasonable as the principle we have advanced naturally evinces 
a third suggestion was made, which was not to perform the cat tap, but to follow exactly the etiquette of England, which is to place one knee upon the ground close to the throne and presenting the credentials. It certainly is an extraordinary presumption for you to attempt to regulate the etiquette of the palace of the Queen King. By that is St. James, the simple principle which has been laid down that in negotiations, as well as in etiquette, the ambassador does not represent the sovereign and has only the right to experience the same treatment as the highest grandee of the place. Clears up the whole of the question and removes every difficulty. Only one reasonable objection presents itself to the mind to wit that the kowtow is a religious act. To such religious act is something idolatrous in it and is consequently contrary to the principles of Christianity. The Mandarins perfectly comprehended the force of this objection and repelled the idea by declaring in an official manner that the kowtow was not a religious act, but simply love etiquette, which ought to have removed every scruple. Russia and England should instruct their ambassadors to submit to the kowtow upon the sole condition that the Chinese ambassadors should submit in London and Petersburg to such forms of etiquette as are practiced by the princes and grandees. Your embassy cost you some hundred thousand pounds which have been thrown away and in place to be the means of approximation will be a foundation for separation out of ill blood between the Chinese and you, and all this by ridiculous misunderstanding and paying respect to the customs of the country. You make those of your own more sacred in every homage which is rendered to a great foreign sovereign in the forms which are in use in his own countries, becoming and honorable. Besides, had not your ministers an example of it? What was always taking place with the port, which has constantly obliged all ambassadors to submit to the etiquette used there. The ambassador is not admitted to the feet of the sublime sultan unless he is clothed in a kafkin and is obliged to perform such ceremonies as the civilization of the port and its greater or lesser degree of power have prescribed and changed, but which still preserve traces of their original character. Is there any great difference between prostrating oneself in order to perform the kowtow and kissing the dust at the feet of the sultan? You say that you might awe them by means of maritime armament, and thus force the manners to submit to the European etiquette. This idea is madness. You'd be very badly advised indeed if you were to call the arms and nation at 200 millions of inhabitants and to compel them in their own defense to build ships against yours. Every sensible man in your country, therefore, can consider the refusal to perform the kowtow no otherwise than as unjustifiable and unfortunate in its consequences.